very much, Keith. And thank you to uh, James Way Chick Master Incubator Company for taking the risk and allowing a Canadian chicken farmer veterinarian to present on your, your fantastic webinar series. I know our, our team here spends a lot of time on the webinar series and we learn a lot and continue to learn a lot. And I think the main premise of my presentation is really to shine a bright light onto how important it is to focus in on incubation and embryology and, and also um, as they hatch and get transported to the farm. A little background on myself, I grew up, um, I'm a, or my parents immigrated from Northern Ireland and they started a, a feed company in 1968. And I attended school at University of British Columbia and I studied uh, linear programming at the time and feed formulation. And then I took off and, and worked on nutrition, did my master's at University of Arkansas. So I am actually an officially approved hog caller, Canadian hog caller. And, and then I went on to veterinary school and um, in 1989 established a, a company, Canadian Poultry Consultants, and in 92, we started farming. And I've been fortunate to be able to make a lot of mistakes along the way. And, and, and by doing that, um, we learn a lot. So what I'm gonna do is um, go straight into my presentation here. Um, there we go. So producing platinum chicks, chick vitality. Uh, I, I like to, a lot of times when growing up, we talk about chick quality and I kind of, I kind of like the term vitality. It, it tells us, uh, has, has more of a, a holistic approach to the concept of chick quality. And then it, I, I like to break it down into four, five areas of, of, um, focus, the physical characteristics of the chick. Does it, the microbiological characteristics and nutritional and metabolic and immunological. And if, when we really focus in on it, some of the, um, the incubation process is so important in all these areas. And then the other thing is learning as a producer, how important this chick vitality is to the ultimate goal of optimum animal welfare, sustainability. And sustainability to me is, is, is one of the most important parts of sustainability is feed conversion. And of course, feed, um, food safety and profitability. I'm, I'm really fortunate here uh, since I, I work with an enthusiastic team and this team, they're, they're younger than me and they're, they're motivated and highly talented. And the key is, is they get up in the wee hours of the morning and the late hours of the night and they, they learn about um, the things that we have to do to focus on prevention. I'd also like to give um, some credit to Dr. Chang He Lee, who was a MAM student at the University of Georgia. And Chang He took a great interest in this producing platinum chicks, and she helped me produce this, this um, presentation in a, in a format that's, you gotta remember, I'm of the age where I use Kodachromes to give my presentation. So I, I wanna really thank Dr. Lee, who's now a regional technical veterinarian in Asia Pacific for Avigen. So. A little bit of history on, on that left picture is my dad. He, that's a, um, you know, he went to school for about eight years in Glasgow and served in the war and then came to Canada after. And, and that's a picture of a, a Quellic computer that formulated about 10 ingredients and it took up the whole room. And then uh, the picture in the center, I found my textbook from 1978. I was Dr. Steele's uh, inaugural student, one of his inaugural students. And I found my notes from the University of Arkansas. And that's quite a few years ago. And when I, when I looked into the notes, I couldn't believe how up to date they were. And that was 1978. And now we're sitting in and I go home in the, at, in the evening and I say, hey Siri, or hey Google, or hey Alexis hey, can you play some relaxing jazz? And, and things have really changed a lot. Um, and maybe there'll come a time where we go in and say, hey, hatchery, hey, pilot egg, tell me how it's going today. Um, go, to, to go back into the conditions that we're dealing in right now, I was at a hockey game with a friend who, who on March the 10th, and it was a, a great hockey game, which is pretty important to us. But this is the day after that hockey game, the, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. And March 17th in the province of British Columbia declared a state of emergency. And if you 
you look at how important this is um, in prevention, and, and we're going through it and we're living it right now. And, and our hockey team on March 31st um, had an outbreak and it, it, it took them out of the league and eight games have postponed. And, and so it's been a very significant um, part of our life, obviously. And, and part of the, the issue is what we call this prevention paradox. And why do I talk about this in, in view of chick vitality? Well, if we work hard and get optimum chick vitality, we can prevent a lot of diseases, a lot of metabolic issues from happening. So this is a letter that was written in the Epidemiological Community Health Journal, and it helps explain the prevention paradox and why, why prevention is tough to sell. So going back again, here's the title, Chick Vitality. We're gonna concentrate on physical, microbiological, uh, nutritional, metabolic, and immunological. Um, our colleagues in Australia um, produced this video and, it, and it's just outstanding. And it, it talks about how important the, it shows how important and how complex this development is. And this is why as a veterinarian and as a nutritionist and as a farmer, we're learning that the importance of optimum incubation, optimum transfer and optimum um, hatching conditions and takeoff and so on, are so important to the physical, microbiological, nutritional, metabolic, and immunological status of the bird. And we look at, we can look at this video and stop it in different places. But right around day 18 or so, we, we see there's a transfer um, happening and the optimum transfer happens. And this is where we're working really hard to understand that. And right around day 20 or so, the pipping process and the hatch profile. And so it's been, it's, it's such a fascinating field. And what we're after is to produce, okay, we called it a platinum chick. And whenever we talk about uh, farming, we always focus in on biodefense or, or biosecurity after going through an avian flu outbreak or after going through foul call, just any infectious disease biodefense or sanitation and isolation and security are just paramount to our entire industry. Um, brooding is something we've started to focus in on, well, probably 18 years ago when we're bringing structure and discipline to that. And then managing metabolic heat, probably right around 2012, we started to really focus in on that. And so this, this particular Prezi presentation has um, behind it, um, a lot of information that we've developed over the years and continue to develop because it, it is quite a, it's such an amazing journey. Um, and, and behind it here is, is this Mandalay system of all the literature and things that back up some of the projects that we're working on. So I take this simplified slide and this picture could represent the hatchery. And on the left of the picture would be your hatching egg production your breeders, um, eggs, how long they're sitting on the floor, et cetera. Uh, they come in and incubate yolk sac utilization. But our goal is to produce more of these chicks here and less of these marginal chicks. And a lot of the hatchery experts um, have, have presented this over and over again. And I guess I'm just one to just really emphasize how important it is to listen to the hatchery experts in optimizing chick development. And you can see this chick weighs 42 grams and this one weighs 42 grams, but there are differences and we'll go through that. So here's our, our, our hatchery here in the middle and our goal is to take these hatching eggs that are fertile, hatch them properly, produce more of these platinum chicks so that they can go to market and, and be more uniform, less condemnations. And one of the, the the earliest benefits you'll see is, is improved fee conversion. So what describes a platinum chick? Well, it's one that has the, the color and I'm gonna repeat it, but that yolk sac contains very important ingredients, carophils, anthophils in nature that are, are very important for reproductive um, integrity and so on. They're very active. These chicks are very active and they're looking forward to getting a bite to eat and drink water when they hit the brood chamber. The yolk sac's been utilized and it's been utilized um, properly. And in that yolk sac are, are micro and, and 
macronutrients that are so important, zinc, for instance, amino acids, fatty acids, and so on. And the other um, metric is these chicks tend to be a little taller that we've found. And this is also in the literature. And our goal is because the genetics are so good, so they're so amazing at, at converting feed and water into, into meat, that our goal is to achieve that, that genetic potential by increasing their vitality. And one of the benefits of producing more chicks that, that have their yolk sac utilized properly and, and stand straight and up is that you don't need um, the, the formaldehydes and the, and the products like antibiotics to help out. You can, you can rely on, on robustness. I guess a good term would be robustness. So here's a marginal chick and the yolk sac is just not absorbed properly. And these chicks are paler, they're less active their yolk sacs are unabsorbed and they're shorter. And part of this, this complex of issues um, involves uh, an impaired immune system. They're more susceptible to infectious disease. And, and this is something that I'm taking a, a reach of faith out here, but I, I strongly believe that these chicks are more susceptible to viral challenges that, may, that may be, they may be exposed to in the hatch or in the field or wherever. Um, ossification, gut health and metabolic imbalance. And we'll go into that a little bit more. So the, the potential impact overheating is, is quite significant. Um, we've been looking at, at glycogen reserves and, and following that, trying to use um, morphometrics and, and special staining, um, increased lactic acid and increased muscle fatigue. Um, trying to help with acid-base balance, uh, negative effects on influence on bone ossification and tight junction permeability. You know, um, I was told by one of my professors that, that, you know, a racehorse that overheats and after the race, they become septicemic and it's because that, that tight junction, the intestinal tight junction has a lot of bacteria into the system. And sometimes these bacteria will float around in the blood system and they'll land, they'll land somewhere and they may land in a thoracic vertebrae such as T6 and you'll end up with a, a spondylolisthesis that, with an abscess and, and a kinky back syndrome. And we also see more infection. We see, you know, if, if the hatchers are a little too hot in some areas, we'll see button navels. We can see yolk sacs that aren't utilized and they're more susceptible to the E. coli that may be around. And this E. coli or salmonella may become septicemic and we see pulmonary congestion and infection. And you can, you can also appreciate leg problems in the field, splay legs and things like that, that we often thought, hey, what's causing this? And um, one of the ways that we can help prevent it is to produce um, high vitality chips. This is 2015 and Basically, this is really when we started to set in on managing metabolic heat. And the other, the other area is, um, is flock uniformity. These chicks um, just don't thrive. And if they are placed in a brood chamber, that's not optimum. And this is why we focus on brooding because if we, if we brood these chicks properly, many of them will survive. Many of them will do, do okay, but they won't do they won't be in first place. Uh, the other area is the immune system. Um, University of Alberta data. This is showing how important incubation temperature is. I, I won't dwell on the specifics, but it basically points out that yolk utilization and the, the immune system are influenced by optimum temperature. So we'll um, delve in now a little bit into managing metabolic heat. And um, Dr. Galen Fasenko at the University of Alberta published what I thought was, um, was very important data on, on all the heat that's produced by these embryos. And, you know, we can talk about different age of breeders, et cetera, and the, and the exact amount of heat, but the key, the key message is there is a significant amount of heat that has to be deal, dealt with. And by putting many eggs into a, an incubator and, moving them around, we have to recognize that we have to manage this heat. And you can see the difference in metabolic heat in, in a duck hatchery or a leghorn hatchery or any, 
it's it's very significant. A couple of the principles that we like to follow, and this is something that that I've been taught as you, as a young student, is is it's really important to be thorough. And and I put this in the platinum brooding checklist, but this could be the metabolic heat checklist, the the bio defense checklist, or any project that you may be working on. Uh, thoroughness that you're performing all the tasks, that you're checking the feed, the light, the litter, the air, the water, the space, the sanitation. And also that the things that you measure are accurate. Um, I've seen situations where uh, the sheet says 10 parts per million of ammonia, but when you walk in the barn, it's 65 parts per million. So you really need accuracy and you need precision. So when you take this out into the field and you look at these chicks and you wonder, you know, right off the top of my head, that looks like they're chilled. But in all reality, what, what is going on here is the CO2 is very high in this farm and they look chilled. And, and the only reason we discovered that is because we had a CO2 meter. And so I, what I'm trying to emphasize is the importance to measure things. And this also happened here in 2012. You can see chicks sleeping where, where you feel that it's cold, but the CO2 in here was well over 7,000 parts per million. And also the nutritionists work very hard and they're talented and they make phenomenal feed. And it's really important that that, that nutrition is utilized properly. Nutrition is very precise and it's such an amazing science. And here it is, they're eating the feed and they're, they're, they're getting it early, but wait a minute, um, how are they gonna get the rest of it? It's just not set up properly. And, and this is the same thing that happens with yolk sac utilization and all that, beautiful breeder feed has been fed to the breeders that goes the, that nutrition is in the yolk and that yolk needs to be utilized properly and that's why that's why we should have nutritionists really promoting um, po positive brooding and positive uh, metabolic heat attributes little things like the maintenance of of uh, misters or nipple drinkers and you can see I, I know I shouldn't probably joke around a little bit but this is a a bartender that's serving and everybody's around this this nipple drinker because it's a lot of the nipple drinkers aren't functioning they're sticky and and the same applies in an incubator with um, spray nozzles and so on they need to be checked and swabbed and so on just like we do with a drinker and then of course these we don't see these anymore um, this has become less and less of a of an issue but this these chicks the whether they're platinum or not or titanium or gold or whatever status you want to call them, they, they can't reach the feed. And so they consume these darkling beetles that are, are uh, chitin and contain all sorts of viruses and bacteria and so on. So, and like I said earlier about, about accuracy and precision, this is the ammonia. So a lot of our work is in brooding, but I'm trying to uh, emphasize the, the same principles of thoroughness, accuracy and precision apply in the incubator in the hatcher and so when we look at chick quality in the past we would we would look at the visual scoring of the chick we would look at hydration look at their hawks their their orbits uh, how they sound you know there's no doubt about it when a chick is thirsty they're 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 very loud um, seven day mortality has always been a metric that we look at but that's highly variable and then the hatch weight really important but is bigger, better, you know. So we're starting to get a little more granular, a little more accurate in, in our um, assessment of chick quality. And one of the areas that, that the hatchery experts really focus in on, and it's, and it's so important, is moisture loss, chick yield, hatch analysis, residue breakout, extremely important, the hatch window. Um, the, the one area that, that I really like to focus in on is yolk utilization. And and sort of correlating that to chick length. And then just recently, clinical pathology, which is using um, an ISTAT analyzer to look at blood chemistry. And blood chemistry, uh, my colleague in Quebec, Dr. Daniel Van, talks about it all the time. It's such an amazing science. It's used in um, small animal medicine. It's used in human medicine. But we, we're starting to apply clinical pathology um, in our, in our um, poultry operations. The other, the other um, important part is um, when you're out working in the field, you'll, you know, some farmer 
or someone may have bought a Ford and someone may have a GM and someone may have a, a, a standard or versus an automatic transmission. With, with single stage and multi-stage, it's really important to focus in on the particular operation that you have because there are very important differences that, that need to be taken into account. And, and that's why with Dr. Bramwell, we like to focus in on, okay, we're dealing with single stage, we're dealing with multi-stage. I'll, I'll never forget the first single stage that we put in. I, I was very confused at the temperatures and things starting out and, and, it's, and it's really interesting. Um, the other part is um, equip yourself with high quality instruments and sensors and, and make records of your adjustments, just like in brooding, um, make your adjustments and then, and then measure how they responded. How was your um, chick mortality? How are your condemns? And start to look at things like culling that, that are connected to your, your chick quality. So if we look at um, in multi-stage scenarios, we look at, or a single stage, we look at where the heat is produced and you know these eggs go in and they're not producing a lot of heat and then they start to produce heat. And it's right around here, day 16, that we've selected as, as the area that will take the temperature, this, this exothermic stage right here. And our, our, our goal is to have very few of these chicks with defective down where they haven't been able to use the utilize the groceries in the egg yolk and their down is not forming properly, their navels aren't healing, and there's other physical characteristics that aren't good. And one of the quickest areas that you can look at is the hatch residue. And right, right here, you can see up here on the slide on the right that there's manure on, on the residue. The pip lines are very jagged and there's an odd um, mortality left in the basket. So some overheating or, or different issue that has to be looked. And here we can see beautiful, um, most of the, it's like a really high quality popcorn, you know, it's all there's not many seeds left in the bottom and it's very clean and, and great pip lines. Uh, hatch analysis and residue breakout is, is, you know, that first video I showed you of all the different stages, it's really important. Um, we like to use that for solving problems. There's all sorts of uh, um, data capture sheets that you can have out there. I like to put in metrics that help me remember things because I have a hard time remembering, uh, you know, should it be 12%, should it be 11? It's just important to have some guidelines in there and, and to follow the metrics that are important to you and what you're trying to solve. So chick length introduced here um, by Dr. Molnar et al in 2008 that we found, and we started to look at that and, and it takes a ruler, it's just, centimeter and and you just measure the length and and i know there's a lot of variability in someone taking this chick length just like someone doing opgs or measuring anything and that's part of the accuracy and the precision part that we talk about but when you look at this a, a young breeder the the shortest chick length that we should be looking at is 19 centimeters so we we followed up on this and we started to take chicks and 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 euthanize them and, and look at the percent residual um, yolk. And this schematic that was produced um, here by hatchability.com is outstanding. It shows poor development, higher mortality, diseases, poor technical results. Same body weight of chick, but this is your platinum chick here. And you can see this chick weighed 45 grams total, but of that 45 grams, 10.1 grams was the was the yolk and, and it wasn't properly absorbed. So we started to look way back in 2014, 15, we started to look at what was happening and here's our floor here. And you can see some chicks a little bit on the small side, but look at the size of the yolk sacs that were still there. And so we had to start making adjustments when we found this out. Um, we started to take, make um, measurements over time and, and here's a, a breeder flock code, um, the chick length. Remember we talked about 19 centimeters as our cutoff and you can see some that are too low and, and all these chicks with milk sacks that aren't properly absorbed. 
Okay, why is that happening? Well, this is where the experts in the in the hatchery come in, and the experts at James Way and, and hatchery companies and incubation specialists around the world are all very good at this. The primary genetics companies have hatchery experts that are just amazing at this. And I often say, just read the manual. It's in the manual. Um, all the information on brooding is is in the manuals, and, and it's a matter of just just doing it and following it. So going in and measuring fan RPM, making sure maintenance is okay. I grew up in a feed mill and, and my dad would always, you know, we had to watch that pellet mill temperature and, and now it's being controlled by uh, sensors and machines. I, I understand that, but it's really important that we keep track of the maintenance of everything going on and the airflow, et cetera. Egg turning is, is very, very important, not only because of the keeping the embryo uh, free to develop within the egg, but it's so important with today's incubation system for airflow and to maintain and manage metabolic heat within the system. So spend some time. Um, this is something that you probably wouldn't do over and over and over again. It's, it's I guess the analogy was would be how often do you check the air pressure in the tires of your car? You know, once in a while, you got to check them because um, if you let them go too low, you'll, you'll, uh, problems. And so here's here's a situation where you go in and check average uh, fan speed and and make the adjustments accordingly. Eggshell temperature versus turn angle. Um, spend some time, go in and dig this out. And as a as a veterinarian, while this is not my area of expertise, I really recognize how important it is to chick vitality. Because as a producer, I really enjoy producing chicks that are that are a high chick vitality. Accurate measurements of the eggshell temperature, and there's, there's debate and information on what sensor and tool to use, and, and that goes back to accuracy and um, precision, but measure the egg and, and utilize the, the pilot egg, utilize the, the technology that's out there to help you fine tune um, metabolic heat. Use uh, precision data loggers, and you can um, use these throughout the hatchery in different in different scenarios, the chick trucks, uh, the brooding chambers, and so on. The, the instruments are out there, and some of them are now um, they're not hard hardwired. There's a lot of Bluetooth sensors that you can um, that you can access. So here's a eggshell temperature in a multi stage system, and you can see everything's going along fine. Um, days of incubation, but here on the right side, or sorry, here on the left side top versus the right side top, you can see the differences. And these are the kind of details that we like to fine tune in order to produce high vitality chicks. This is so important here as well. Um, in, in the hatchery, you've taken all these eggs, um, did such a great job of incubating them, and then you run them through, you may have vaccinated them, and now you're putting them in the hatcher and they're in a, in a smaller box in a box or in a smaller container. And you wanna make sure that there's uniform hatcher temperature. And this will influence chick quality and button navels, et cetera. Um, fan stands that are out of adjustment, et cetera. And this is um, all so important in, in the ultimate goal of you know, producing uh, high vitality chicks. Effective root reduced hatcher points. So this is something. Remember, we talked about um, we talked about. Um, I don't want to get into the specifics of ninety seven point five versus ninety eight point five, but we can see the influence on incubation on the hatcher fertile, and and the quality of the chicks being hatched. And then follow these chicks once they're hatched and they're they're looking good. You want to follow and make sure they're comfortable, and you can use these. Um, Bluetooth data loggers and the chick boxes to make sure the information and they're they're cared for in the truck because overheating here or overheating in the in the brood chamber can also um, result in in issues for these chicks. Okay, getting close here. Um, chick transport temperatures again um, measure. We we've had a situation here where we get a 
minus 30 degrees or minus 20 degrees centigrade and it's very cold outside and and there are things you can do to help mitigate temperature swings. Just uh, spend some time measuring it, possibly seasonal, depending on what part of the world you're in and, and what type of uh, temperatures you're involved with. There's parts of Canada that get very, very cold, but they're very, very dry. And so we're balancing humidity challenges all the time and so on. And then, uh, you know, our goal is to take out formaldehyde. It's, 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 it's one of the most um, effective disinfectants. I'll tell you, it's very, very effective, but it's also dangerous. And our goal is to reduce pathogen reduction. So we've started on this path of what I call the shift to beneficial bacteria, where there's bacteria that are good out there. There's a lot of good bacteria, beneficial bacteria, and we can influence that by what we give our breeders and the feed and the water and even in the, the nest material. And we can also influence and apply, um, take away the antibiotics, take away the formaldehyde, and we can start to apply beneficial bacteria within these chambers. And you saw that video of the chick pipping and that's when they're exposed to these good bacteria. And then there's all sorts of mechanisms for, or sorry, um, products out there that you can look at for, for um, transporting chicks. And this was developed many years ago when we used to um, deliver chicks to China and, and we would have a lot of visceral gout. And NMAN was developed. It's a nutrient matrix for avian neonates. It's congealed water with carbohydrates and vitamins. And it can act as a vehicle for probiotics as well. So to drill in on some of the, the some of the data that I get to do and and uh, is we took some of these chicks that were less than 19 centimeters from a placement, and we took some that were greater than 19 centimeters, you can see here. And then we weighed the chicks and we sacrificed, or sorry, euthanized, and there's our yolk utilization numbers. And our, our target is less than 10%. So if chick weighs 40 grams, we want the yolk sac to weigh less than four grams. And these are the chicks that are a little taller, and we um, saw that we had yolk utilization that was not perfect, but it was, it was better. Now, the other thing that we have uh, built is what we call a commercial mini pen. So we can take uh, 12 chicks per pen, there's 24 pens, and we divided uh, the chicks that were over 19 centimeters and the chicks that were less than 19 centimeters. And we just ran them through a commercial mini pen system. And we ended up um, with this type of data. We, did the average placement weight and it was 39.5 grams for this group. And these chicks were actually bigger. Um, they grew till 38 days. This is the chick length here. And our feed conversions, you can see were impacted uh, significantly. The stats aren't on here, but that's uh, highly significant. And the body weight gains and the performance and so on. So we feel like we're on the, on the right track. We also feel like uh, the, um, the Attention that you that you spend on incubation and hatching and, and the use of all the experts in the field can really influence your feed conversion and your overall sustainability. So here's our operations in 2018. There were six cycles in this group. Our feed conversion to average 1.7, and uh, we we consumed this much water, this much electricity. This much gas, our index was, was quite high and our gross margin was here. When we started to focus in on uh, many of the metrics and, and fee conversion was one of them, you can see the impact of chick vitality on sustainability. And, and that's why this is so exciting um, because the genetic potential that we have, um, we can see that these numbers are gonna go much lower. Um, we're seeing fee conversion uh, variation of one of 20 points and, and it's that variation that, that offers the opportunity. Some of the areas that we're going to continue to work on that I, I consider that what I like working on at, at my age and, and so on, but Fred Harris helped me with this out in Auburn. He's developed a way to help me follow the glycogen and the tissues of these chicks through histopathology and morphometric studies. This is a ticker tape from a, um, an ISTAT alinity 
analyzer and we like to look at blood chemistry and we can start to fine tune um, potassium and sodium and understand what we're doing. And this is, has everything to do with um, uh, leg disorders. I, I, I'm a student of Dr. Craig Riddle from the University of Saskatchewan and we talk about how important dyschondroplasia is in, in blood chemistry and calcium phosphorus and so on. It's, it's such an exciting field. And then these are the good bacteria that we're starting to isolate and, and work to, to shift the beneficial bacteria as opposed to, okay, we're gonna kill the bad guys. That, that makes sense, but we're gonna, we're gonna now start working on shifting the population to beneficial. Um, as a veterinarian, we develop um, broader vaccination programs, broader breeder vaccination programs that are designed to um, produce antibody and, uh, and the egg yolk and, and the blood. And we want that antibody to be transferred to the chick in the yolk. And, and that's why it's so important that we manage metabolic heat. So we take advantage of the expertise and the, and the, the, the very diverse um, vaccine programs. And these are the, the DSM eggs that they have when it comes to Carafel. And you can see, you know, there's a whole industry in the commercial egg industry and omega-3 eggs and, and all sorts of uh, vitamin D3, uh, xanthophil, well, all that's important as well for chick vitality. So it's important we get yolk utilization and take advantage of those nutritional uh, benefits. And I think we're all done here. Uh, just a quick slide here. It's my second um, grandchild's birthday today. Happy birthday, Ren. This is her and this is her um, being immunized by being exposed to dirt. This is my other daughter who's expecting a baby in, in August. And it's quite a, a, quite a challenge with um, the pandemic going on and her working on the front lines. But um, the prevention paradox does work. Prevention does pay. And we're practicing it in real life, not only in our chickens, but uh, also um, with our frontline workers in, in the field out there. So uh, thanks again to, to James Way Chickmaster for taking the risk and allow me to talk to you about this. And, and I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions or we'll go from Thank there. You. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Stu. Not much of a risk. I mean, it'll all, all be good. Yeah. And I'll say, and I'll say uh, happy birthday to Ren as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Since, yeah. Uh, since we're all here. So very good. I, I always enjoy listening to you talk. And I always know, because I've heard you give these presentations several different times, there's so much more in your head that yeah. <laughs> you're trying to decide how much of it to put out and how much not, because each time I learn a little bit different from you, because you, you yeah. talk a little, about a little bit different things. So very, very good. Um, a few questions here. Um, one, one of our viewers had said they're, they're seeing continual incidences of, of leg weakness um, in coming out of the hatchery, even though they feel like they're maintaining proper temperatures and everything at the hatchery. I mean, what could you guess might be the reason for that? Um, it's it, leg weakness is very multifactorial. There, there's so many different um, uh, possible causes. One of, one of the key things with when I, when I hear the term leg weakness, that's, that's a broad term. So it, to be able to get a definitive diagnosis would, would be very helpful. And, and that would involve sending um, these chicks into a diagnostic laboratory and to, to do a workup on what could be this weakness. Is it, it can you rule out infectious versus non-infectious and so on? But as, as far as incubation goes, um, one of the key areas is, is yolk sac utilization. So drill in, find out that these chicks are properly utilizing the yolk sacs and, and then and go backwards from there. But everything starts with a definitive diagnosis from a, from a pathologist in a laboratory. And it's really important that a good sample is taken in so that you can look and if you, you know, I've, I've had a case where a D3 was missing in a breeder feed and it did, did transfer and it caused significant damage at the broiler level. So it probably, I've been at this over 40 years and it's happened once. So it's kind of rare, but um, the key is a definitive diagnosis. Uh, leg weakness is a general term for me and I, I have a hard time um, drilling in to what it could be specifically. So if you're so if you're seeing and this kind of goes into another um, discussion we've had, 
people that are seeing some issues out in the field with, with some leg problems and 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 they they think that's attributed to the hatchery but coming out of the hatchery they're not seeing any signs of that i mean is, is there some things incubation wise that could cause that that may not show up in your hatch chicks yeah well up later like variations within the cabinets uh that, that that has to be sorted out and that that involves getting your hatchery experts in there to make sure that everything is uniform and so on and also after they're hatched and sitting in the chick room making sure that they're not all packed on one side of the chick boxes and 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 just the environment in general and then that includes the brew chamber um if if you overheat in the brew chamber you can you can set off different um um, pathologies there as well okay so it's a lot of different factors there, there's just a lot of factors yeah yeah um you had mentioned uh, formaldehyde and its use in the hatcheries and it great disinfectant and a lot of people have used it for a long time but but it's it can be damaging as well um do you see often see effects on chick quality if um with formaldehyde use if it's used properly and of course if it's not but I, I think formaldehyde, if it's used properly, is extremely effective. It's we're we're lucky to have it. However, it's a carcinogen, and it's one of those things that we want to stop using. And and uh, it it's there to kill. It's there to kill agents. So I think part of the the move to remove it is to is to start to fine tune incubation, hatching, and and get yolk utilization so that they're less susceptible to these E. coli and so on. And then part of our work too is to start to shift the bacteria in the cabinets, in the building, in the, that come to you from, start to shift to beneficial bacteria. And we, we've actually been able to show that you can expose birds to, to beneficial bacteria. They'll hatch with these beneficial bacteria and they'll, they'll defecate these out three days later. So we know we can do it. Um, the, the, the key will be, does it really make a difference in the economics, et cetera. But um, formaldehyde is dangerous. I don't like being exposed to it. I don't want my kids exposed to it. I don't want people I work with exposed to it. So if, I, if you're gonna use it, do it right and, and get good advice. Yeah. So so the, the when you talk about it being dangerous, it's more so for people, but if it's used right, it's still annoying to people, but for chick quality, is it the chicks? Chick, chick, chick quality can benefit from from formaldehyde you know it can it, it'll change the color of the chicks so that that can influence your interpretation of yolk utilization as well you know if, if you're feeding corn versus wheat you'll see the chick color variations you know maize feeding countries uh, have very good chick quality and and uh, a lot of it is is there so the formaldehyde does hide things it does hide underlying things and and what are they hide? What is it hiding? We don't really know until we take it away. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and then you take it away and you think, whoa, what's there? Um, you know, what what's behind the drywall? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, it does it does cover a lot of things, which is you know helpful for a lot of hatchery managers, but at the same time, what is the root that yeah, know? yeah. Is it is it covering something up? Not unlike antibiotics. I grew up using <laughs> Chloramphenicol, NF-180, it goes on and on and on. And as we take them away, it uncovers things that we have to get better at. And, mm -hmm. and that's why platinum brooding evolved because uh, we have to brood better in order to have these birds become immune to coccidiosis, for instance. Mm -hmm. And and when these band-aids were taken off, it exposed some of our weaknesses and, and therefore we could fix those weaknesses. Yeah. So, sometimes sense. taking the risk and taking off a band-aid to check the wound uh, can be beneficial too. <laughs> yeah. I have personal experience in that, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so one of the questions they said, do you think that chicks are hatching early in the hatch window? Obviously, if we've got a narrow hatch window, we we eliminate or reduce some of the effects of you know a big hatch. But if you have a the earliest hatching chicks in a hatch window, that's maybe not ideal. Or would they be more susceptible to heat stress and glycogen loss? Yeah, they, they're, they're going to be utilizing their nutrition. They're going to, they're going to need to get on feed earlier. Um, and so if, if those chicks are transported and, and they land in challenging brood conditions, they're, they're the ones that'll, that won't 
um, prolific won't um, do well. There, there, that's where your flock uniformity is affected and things like that. The, the downstream effects on flock uniformity are quite significant if, if you've delayed them a long time. Right. Yeah, they, that, you know, that hatch window is incredibly important because it- Yeah, it's, and it's, it's it, I, I know it's complicated, but I guess all I'm trying to do is say how important your job is to, as a veterinarian, to prevent disease long-term. I, I just feel that more and more veterinarians, more and more nutritionists are gonna understand how important embryology chick nutrition is. I, you know, personally, my wife's a retired neonatal care uh, nutritionist and, and uh, it's, it's just vital. It's, it's really important. And, and what I see is when, when attention is put in, I see the results. Like we have results in the field now of amazing, uh, almost zero, like amazing technical results. And that's because the genetics are so good and, and it's up to us to catch up and, and keep up to the potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the, in these chicks, particularly to say we got some dehydration issues um, and, and then we're also faced with long transportation. Yeah. What are some recommendations for that? I know you talk about the end man, which probably probably. Yeah. Yeah. Some other recommendations with that. If we, if we know we don't have the best hatch window yet, we're going to have some long. Yeah. So, so making sure the humidity is in check and we're not dehydrating them even further, and which can be a challenge in some regions, extreme challenge. Um, the end, the end man, uh, I wish it paid in, in um, all the broiler chicks, but we're, we're not sure where the cutoff is. We think it's six to eight hours, somewhere around there where we'll benefit to consuming water and carbohydrate and canola oil and vitamins at that age so you you can do that if you have to transport we we know for a fact that if they're going for a day or two and flying over the continent or the pond that the nutrient matrix will keep them alive um we 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 know of turkey poults twenty thousand at a time that go to different continents and they arrive and they're not loud and they're not screaming and they're not drowning in water because they're satisfied it, it's all you have to do is go on a long flight to Australia and know the importance of drinking water as you go. Uh, and if you don't, how big of a headache and how bad you feel when you get there. Right. And, and these chicks are, they're, they're 40, 50 grams and they're dehydrating and they, they, they need the moisture and, and hydration is part of health. It helps everything. All your motors run. It's, it's the oil. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, so. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, what, uh, you talk about the platinum brooding and you'd always do a really good job with that and chick. So question was, is what additional care programs, maybe even nutrients could somebody use on these little broilers from these 26 week old breeder flocks that, you know, the first, yeah. the first, the low, the new number of the breeder flock source that the people get, they're like, oh crap, we've got some new, yeah. what do you yeah. suggestions or recommendations? Well, I guess, I guess with that, I, I, you know, the, the starter feeds that are being formulated now are, are highly digestible, very, very good. I mean, the, the, the feeds are formulated by experts. And so it's our, our it's important that the feed um, um, quality and, and the size of the feed is the right. They like to eat particles of a certain size. It has to be available. So you may want to add more satellite drinkers. You may want to add more brood um, creep feed, as we say in the hog industry, or we, you know, I like to add a few more trays, um, uh, chick paper and so on. And you, you can harvest and you can look after small chicks, but they won't do as well. They, 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 they'll, they'll lag behind the, the top ones. It's just nature. And, and we're not quite sure where the cutoff point is. Like I know a 48 gram chick or egg, sorry, in a 52 gram egg, like our cutoff is around 52 grams, which would be a, say a 34 gram chick. We know if you look after the 34 gram chick, it'll do well, it'll meet its potential. But it'll also, if it's treated, if it can't reach the feed or it can't reach the water, it will fall off faster than the, the one that has more vitality. I think the margin for error is is uh, much smaller. Yeah. We've got these young chicks, you really need, really probably should be doing all the things you were supposed to do in the first place, but doing them very well. Yeah. But it'll, it'll show. And, 
and you know, Keith, uh, there's no doubt about it. I, and we joke about this a little bit. A lot of this is in the manual. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the primary genetic companies have written some of the best material on brooding I've ever seen on patching on, on it, it really is there for us to read and to gather. The hard part is doing it. And, and I, I know as a, as a owning a farm that it, it's farming isn't eight to five, it's 24 seven. And, and uh, so is, so is the incubation process, the hatching process. I get, we're in agriculture, so it's 24 seven, 365, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I see just like we have in, in our own, in our cars, like I drive a really snazzy electric car now and I hardly have to do anything. It's, it, 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 it's times have changed. Yeah. And, and I see it in, in, in agriculture and some of the buildings and the hatcheries that they're phenomenal, but we're still going to have to watch the physiology, the microbiology, the nutrition. We're still going to have to keep track of it. Our, the automobiles we drive now have automatic air tire sensors. But every now and then you got to check it. Yeah. And and yeah, that goes with everything. I mean, our you know the the more technology we get in our equipment and everywhere hatchery process and whatever, yep. you know, we still have to follow up, maintain. We, we it. still have to maintain it and 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 check it. Yeah. Okay. When you're looking at, um, say, you go in your forty something years experience, um, what would be the primary cause you think when people are having some poor chick quality, which you would say they're not producing a platinum chick. What are um, the things you see as the biggest issues you, you normally see? Yeah, well, if you, if you look back to egg pack, you, you think, the, how, how long are the eggs on the floor? That's, that's you know, I'm just saying the low hanging fruit here. Right. Um, or maybe fruit that's landed on the ground. Uh, <laughs> that low, huh? That, that low. Um, egg sweating. Egg sweating is a, is a, is a driver of getting bacteria through the shell and so on. So egg sweating needs to be really checked. And then, and then I think when it comes to staging and, and using the technologies that the spides and, and, and the, the different ideas on, on heat transfer. And I, I really think that uh, sorting out if you have hot spots is one of the key areas. And, and that can be that can be difficult, especially when you have a lot of machines and so on and so forth. It can be very difficult, but it's 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 one of the most common causes of, of heating. Overheating seems to be when when I think of overheating, I, I tend to think intestinal damage. When I think of chilling, I kind of think more respiratory problems and E. coli and air sacculitis and so on. And, and quite often chilling and heating can actually happen in the same cabinet. And, and then you'll end up with these hot, like the, we used to call it CRD, like just little CRD chickens at two weeks and, and, and they were chilled. And, and if you see ascites or cardiopulmonary disease, they were chilled. And, and so you have to drill back and, and it's the prevention paradox is you, you need to prevent these things because there's no treatment for some of these metabolic diseases. It's, it's, it's really just calling, you know, and that, and I think, you know, that goes back to a lot because our, our machines typically, you know, typically even our multi-stage, they give us a, they give us an average temperature. Yeah. So, you know, our temperatures are right, but if we don't really delve in and I like what you did there where you did, you know, you periodically go in and check your shell temperatures at different parts of the machine, yeah. do it through, yeah. uh, you know, and then I'll, I'll do breakouts sometimes and I'll separate it by top, middle, bottom, inside, outside yeah. of the cabinet to kind of, to kind of see because, you know, it's good to get that average so we know, okay, we're there, but then how narrow it, just like a hatch window is good. Yeah. Uh, the temperature window within and there, the, good as well. An analogy that I could use in my brooding, um, our, our barn is say 400 feet long, 500 feet long. And there's a lot of brooders down there and one or two may be out or, or at an angle. And it's the same thing. Look at all the chicks that are in one hatch or no. It's, yeah. it's pretty significant. So I, I think, the attention to detail, the, the thoroughness, accuracy, and precision is, is really how much effort you put into getting the details right. Right. And, and, and if we do, the chickens do extremely well because as a producer, it's really fun to grow these birds now. Um, they, 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 they do very well. And it's very profitable too because um, I, I, I know for a fact when we 
fine tune and manage metabolic heat. There's no doubt about it. Fee conversion improves. I, I don't, the jury's in, you know, it's the, mm -hmm. it's, the decision's in. Yeah. The jury's in or the jury's out, however you want to put it. The, right? Yeah, the jury's not out on fee conversion with good chicks. It's it's uh, it's no doubt about it. It's very significant. So follow that up with what you see as the primary causes from um, not producing platinum chicks out of the hatchery. What about the farm? What are some of the primary causes you might see? After uh, yeah, farm? when you get to the farm, some of the, this is way less now, but when when we first started where, where the feed is too high, um, hot and cold spots in the brew chambers, uh, not not bright enough light. Um, so if you, if you use the acronym flaws, feed, light, litter, air, water, space, security, sanitation, um, but feeder height, feed accessibility, nipple drinkers, not operating properly, too high, too low, or water that's really cold. Um, and that can happen, say, if you flush in a cold environment and then these chicks are, they're small and they drink cold water, that, that can, that can, that can be hard on them. And, and I know there's debate on when to flush, et cetera, et cetera, but really cold water on a chick is hard on them. Um, so our, our benefits um, by focusing on, on brooding have been that our coccidiosis vaccines are now able to work because you get feed intake, which means crop fill. So when, when you go in at 24 hours, 100% of the chicks have feed in their crops. But if you go in and 20% don't. That means 20% haven't started their engine yet. And it's quite significant. And, and it's, it's a lot better. And that's why platinum brooding has been, you know, it's, it's, I, I showed my notes from 1978 from the University of Arkansas. It was all in there. <laughs> it, 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 it's, not it, new. It's, 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 it's not new, everyone. This is, I'm not, uh, this is not new technology. The chickens have to eat in a steady state. They like to eat every four hours. That was Dr. Stan Savage's gift to the industry and, and, a, yep, and a, I remember that. yeah a chick a chick is a crop and they had to run out and hide you know and, and so we just need to do a good job of what nature presented us with and, and it'll it'll pay back yeah you know? yeah but the good old Stan Savage you know met yep. him years and years ago yeah um, so talking about your water at the farm, what what uh, would you consider a good pH in the water, and how big of an effect? Um, well, that's a big nutrition. Science. That's a big topic. A um, lot of science involved there with respect to organic and different mm -hmm. acids. But we we like to keep our pH below seven, and and we actually we actually follow some of the guidelines of suppliers of acids where where we'll have it down to five and let it go to six, and then five. You know, we'll change. Because we we noticed the chicks actually like like drinking the water, and we also keep track of the water to feed ratio to make sure that it's that it's um, in check as well. We know if you're going to have a constraint of feeding an all vegetable diet, you may have more water going into the barn because there's issues with an all vegetable diet that may present increased water. And we our our sensors have told us that they consume up to 18 percent water. That's our own farm, but. So you need to make adjustments um, with respect to ventilation. Um, and, and that's where the experts in ventilation, you know, Dr. Zarek at University of Georgia, oh my goodness, that more, more information there that helps prevent disease than you yeah. can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I guess all I'm doing is rooting for all, all the, the things I was taught by my professors over the years. And, and so you saying, wrote your own manual in 1978, right? Yeah, that was my notes from Dr. Steele's class. And, and I've got my Dr. Riddle notes from, I don't want to age myself, but they, they too were, you know, Dr. Julian talked about cardiopulmonary disease and cold temperatures back yeah, then, yeah. you know. Um, so what, what would your recommendations be? Um, and I kind of know that you and I've talked about it to replace formaldehyde. You kind of talked about it a little bit in your presentation. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like, uh, how did we replace chloramphenicol and NF-180 and some of the other things and the challenges that we deal with blackhead and turkeys and we, we have to replace it with, um, and this is not a good joke, but we have to replace it with a good essential oil called elbow grease and, and attention to detail. And I think, I think what I would like to encourage folks to do is spend a lot of time, I don't know, um, spend money on, maintenance and detail and so on, and then take the risk and pull the formaldehyde out. 
and see where you're at. See if you need it. Yeah. Take take the chance. And and uh, and there are there are ideas. This shift to beneficial has got a lot of potential. We're going to keep looking at it. And and it's very inexpensive. I know it's something that I. I have a hard time really talking about it a lot, but yeah, man. But I, I, I do believe in beneficial bacteria, and and if if we can do it economically and without getting chicks or anything wet, which is what we've discovered we can do, then I think there's great. And then when these beneficial organisms become vegetative, they start to produce the enzymes that kill the pathogens. Mm -hmm. So we we basically just magnify what nature wants us to do. Or you you teach that in your classes with the with the hen and how they turn the eggs and the, the beneficial bacteria from the feathers and and so on and it, it's all there for us to learn from nature yeah. so so can we produce good beneficial bacteria that will survive yes it looks like we can and it does look exciting and and can we help nutritionally uh, you know the sharma patent is 50 microliters into the amnion, can we help? And and yes, I believe we can. So, um, this kind of comes, I think, combination hatchery or veterinary experience. Chicks that receive an ACOC city stats at the hatchery, what are precautions or care for litter management at the farm to kind of break that cycle? Bacterial stats at the hatchery. So, don't know of any. Um, oh, oh, coccidiosis vaccines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, a coccidiosis vaccine will be placed on the down of the bird, either in a, in a small bead or, or, or water, and they need to preen. And the way to, to get them preening is with light and time, and they need time to preen. And so that's, that's key. So, so you hatch your chicks, and you apply the vaccine according to the vaccine manufacturer's um, detailed recommendations. And then, and then they go down a nice slow belt in bright light. And I, I kind of joke around a little bit, but play some music, get it active in there and have these chicks uh, um, preen. And, and when they preen, you can actually put dye in the vaccine. You can see it in the mouth of the bird and you get better uniformity. And then when the chicks are placed, it's really important they get on their feet early so that the cycling can happen. And, and your litter moisture is such that the oocyst can, can sporulate and, and you're, when, when the birds are eating, they can be existed and you need bile, you need pancreatic enzymes. And the only way those are secreted is if they're eating. Mm -hmm. So, so having these birds properly um, vaccinated, good lighting system, and you can get information um, from experts in the field on a, on, on, you could call it a preening belt. That's what we call it, a preening belt. And it's been very successful. Um, I'm going to let you, I could talk with you all day about questions. I like, I like chatting with you and hearing your yeah. thoughts, but I'm going to let you put on your, your special glasses right now. What do you well, see is realistic things that may come in the future that we need to be aware of? And there are probably some good things, I think, but there may be some bad things that you see um, coming up that, that I think maybe everybody should be aware of. Yeah. From, from this 35, may not be a right or wrong answer. This is your opinion. So <laughs> yeah, I, I just think that we as um, poultry producers need to become transparent and let people in to see what we're doing. And and also um, I, I feel that we can focus our metrics in on sustainability, not as a bad word, as a good one. Um, sustainability to me is is um, using our resources, our efficient utilization of resources and not wasting and not polluting. And I, I feel poultry is in such an amazing spot because they can take resources that that are hard for us to consume and convert it to eggs and meat that is absolutely wonderful for, for our diet. And, and so the science is phenomenal. So I see sustainability, animal welfare, sustainable, they're, they're all connected. And I just feel that um, the, other, the other thing I think is that when we bring people in to see what we're doing and become transparent, we tend to improve how good of a job we do. And it, I, I guess the analogy is, is if you bring people over for a dinner party, you tend to clean up before they come over. And, and I, I just think that, that showing off what we do is, is gonna be beneficial for us and it's gonna make us improve. 
Or make and us do the right thing. Make us read the manual to do it the right make, way. Yeah, yeah, read the manual. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I literally, I'm not a mechanic at all, but I, I've been able to fix things by reading the manual. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite obvious, but it's true. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's there. The, the, the James Way manual outlines, the MREX outline, it's unbelievable. The information's there, the primary genetics uh, documents they produce are phenomenal read them <laughs> and, yeah. and and then try them and then and then okay take away the we i remember hey we're, we're not going to be able to use nf-180 well things we, we it's not a big deal we don't use it you know yeah. some sometime they're going to say no formaldehyde maybe yeah in some places they have yeah some places they have so it'll be yeah and my my premise is okay let's do it Let's take it off and let's see how we can do it. Don't, you know, don't learn, to, learn to deal without it. Yeah. And then I, 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 I've also, I've got another generation coming in and they're very interested in sustainability and chick quality, chick vitality is a big part of it. So not only how we use our, our gas and our, so we, we've spent a lot of time and money with solar recapture, rainwater recapture, um, using our gas properly. Um, just, it's so exciting. I wish I could turn the uh, time back 40 years and start. <laughs> Knowing what you know now, go back. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's so exciting. The future looks really exciting. Yeah. Um, a couple more comments. Again, I talked a long time with you, but if you could looking through some of the questions and some of the questions that were asked, we, we didn't quite get to. And, you know, we'll be able to answer them later. I think it might be more appropriate some of them later. But these come up again, several different questions again on hatchery reasons for leg weakness and we're talking what i'm looking i mean what it's hard to summarize but there are several questions they're asking in several different ways i mean what are your thoughts on that what, what do you yeah think? well i think it's death by a thousand cuts um i think you have to apply the principles of what you teach what you teach dr bramwell in a in a single stage or a multi-stage get optimum yolk sac utilization Brew them properly. And my, our experience is the leg problems disappear. And this is the, this is the prevention paradox we talk about. Spend a lot of time focusing in on, on those physical, microbiological, all those characteristics and fine tune it. And my, my feeling is those leg problems, you prevent them. Mm -hmm. um, can you treat them? It depends. Um, do you give them vitamin D or calcium formate in the water? Do you give potassium chloride in the water to help them? Those are things that you may want to try after you've decided that that's, you know, there's metabolic issues going on. But yeah, lake, lake problems are, there's different types, you know, uh, it, if you take a foundation of a bridge and you move it off a couple of centimeters, it really doesn't show off until they put the weight on until the bridge is built and and so a lot of these fine tuning of the the growth plates happen in the embryo and and i i think by paying attention to the details of incubation and hatching and brooding you will have more impact on preventing leg problems than you can imagine. So. Mm -hmm. all right well thank you very much everybody for joining and thank you uh um stuart uh, yeah. it was always a pleasure chatting with you i think we